What's Up, Doc Mike, Public Health on Call, by Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today's topic for January 6, 2021, the challenges with communicating COVID-19 prevention measures. Thank you, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome to Season 3 of Public Health on Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to freelance science journalist Roxanne Kamsey about the challenges we face in communicating how to keep safe during the pandemic. Let's listen. Roxanne Kamsey, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Stephanie. So you are a freelance science writer who has covered the pandemic from the beginning. And you've written some really interesting stories. And so I'd like to sort of talk to you today about how we communicate about the pandemic. Um, something I wanted to talk to you about is sort of we have we talk about having science-based COVID prevention measures. And while things like, of course, mask wearing and hand washing are definitely backed by science, we have things that maybe aren't so backed by science that we're claiming are. Talk to me a little bit about that and maybe give me a few examples. Yeah, I think what you're saying is really true that um, there are some things that make a lot of sense scientifically. And then we have seen in this pandemic a couple occasions or maybe more than a couple occasions where uh, public health officials or politicians have come forth with some policies to cope with COVID-19 that just have people scratching their heads a little bit. Like, for example, um, one thing that people in Spain were telling me is that they closed the parks, but they kept the restaurants open. And to folks um, who have been following how, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is potentially spread airborne, or it can be, um, and that indoor environments are more risky, that was a really puzzling example. And like another one that's a little bit more, uh, two examples that are a little bit more out there is that South Africa wanted to ban people from doing too much shopping that was like, um, not necessary in their winter time. So they said you couldn't buy closed toed shoes. I'm sorry, you couldn't buy open toed shoes. Um, closed toed shoes was fine, but they didn't want people getting sandals in the winter. They thought that would just encourage people to go out shopping unnecessarily, which I mean, maybe so, but the science about whether that's really the most efficient policy um, to institute is, is unbeknownst to me. And the last one I'll mention is that uh, here in Canada where I am, uh, the country's chief public health officer in September recommended that people, if they're going to have sex with partners that aren't people they live with, wear a mask. And it just <laughs> made people kind of step back and say, is that really going to protect you if you're having sex with someone from getting COVID-19? Um, so, yeah, it's like, as you said, like some of these policies, they don't really seem to be that evidence-based. Mm -hmm. But even say... Uh, staying six feet apart, even that's not necessarily so science-backed, is it? Yeah, I mean, like, there's some science there, but it goes back decades and isn't really as um, precise, maybe, as we would hope it to be. Like, it, it, the six-foot rule has its origins way back in the 1930s with this um, this guy, uh, William Wells, who had kind of studied how far droplets go when you cough. And later on, after World War II, there were some experiments where scientists put people in like a apartment type situation together in an experimental setting. They called them like the honeymoon suites. And they would kind of observe how much one would transmit flu to the other. Later on, there were card games that people played. Um, in an experimental setting to see if somebody sitting at the card table would transmit to another person. Um, and so from that, that was kind of assumed that it was a three foot distance that would be required. Um, and then later on, more recently with um, 
the swine flu outbreak and with the original SARS outbreak, they found out that mm, actually three feet might not be enough distance uh, based on looking, for example, at uh, where people are seated on planes where they transmitted to one another. So the two, two rows apart, there was a transmission that seemed like six feet. I mean, the thing is, is it's a spectrum and um, it, there are so many factors that could play into the six foot is a, is a rule of thumb, but um, it's not the most scientific rule of thumb. So do you think that, you know, some of the messaging isn't really working, right? Where people are still not following guidelines. And so my question is, do you think that this sort of this odd mishmash of science-y uh, rules, maybe that aren't so scientific, I mean, do you think that's helping people, helping to sort of confuse people? I mean, is that making people say, well, what is this nonsense? And so I'm not going to follow the rules. I mean, I don't know about you. I found it really hard to keep up with the rules. Um, yeah, they seem to change quite often, and you know, the pandemic situation changes quite often as well. So I grant that, like, messaging will change to some degree. But I, I, I think that each locale seems to have its own approach. Um, you know, it, it, in life, it's lovely to have some things be bespoke. Like you would want a suit to be bespoke to you, or um, maybe a haircut or something like that. But uh, I don't think that the tailoring of this to each individual location has really reflected um, kind of a consistency in approaches to science. It's some, sometimes it feels like we're living in different worlds where, where different public health officials are looking at different data and making different decisions. And I think it's become exhausted, uh, ex exhausting for the public. Mm -hmm. And it probably feeds into sort of this whole anti-science attitude that we are seeing. I certainly don't think it helps. Like, for sure, I, that's a concern of mine, like 1,000%. Yeah. You know, something else that you have written about, which is really interesting to me, is uh, you wrote a piece called The Pandemic Must Be Seen. Can you tell me about that piece? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I at the same time that we're being bombarded with all these public health messages about, you know, wash your hands, don't buy open-toed shoes or whatever, have sex with a mask, uh, don't go to a bar after 10 p.m. or stuff like that. I, I think that um, in some sense, the, the pandemic's real effects are invisible or not discussed or not seen. And that is that, you know, when you get this virus, if you are unfortunate enough to have it really hit you hard, um, it can feel, from what I've heard, like you are drowning on land because your lungs fill with liquid and um, we take for granted every second of the day, even when we're asleep, the ability to breathe. And I do think that the, the very devastating effect of this virus's ability to steal away someone's ability to breathe and, and potentially their life, it just isn't shown on the TV. It isn't shown in public service announcements. It's not photographed that much because it's happening in hospitals where there's privacy laws and things like that. So yeah, I think we're living in a time of an invisible pandemic. I think, you know, even someone close to me said, well, I don't know anyone who's had it. So how bad could it really be? I mean, I, I know people have had it. I know people have mild cases who are very sick, um, but we don't see that at all. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I know people that have had it that also got very sick, but I mean, they, they didn't end up hospitalized. I should knock on wood for that, but I, I, I didn't even see them at their sickest because um, they were self-isolating and, right. you know, I could get a sense from their text messages that they really weren't doing well. And yeah. you know, so I, I just feel like even those of us who do have people we know get sick, even family members who pass away, they're, um, you know, FaceTiming for a second or two, or, you know, it's, it's all, it's all behind, uh, like the barrier of, of the hospital for good reason, but also it makes it more complicated for us to see what's going on. And it, it feeds into what you're talking about, which is this disbelief that it's actually a thing. Mm -hmm. Actually, just before this call, a good friend of mine who's a, uh, who's a pulmonary PA, she sent me a picture of what she's wearing today. And I will tell you that it was 
it was scary. You know, this is what she has to wear. You know, not only is she wearing, you know, the face shield and she's covered in, a, you know, wearing like a moon suit, but she also ha had a breathing apparatus that looked out of some sort of sci-fi movie. And I thought, I don't think people get it. I mean, I sort of wanted to just, I know, I just wanted to post her picture everywhere. I'd be like, this is what she has to wear to protect herself from this horrible virus. Yeah, and we often see images of of the protection that people are wearing or the, you know, you see the B-roll from the hospitals where people are kind of calmly, I don't know, like doing this or that. Um, but, you know, behind that, there are um, moments of grief and there are moments of stress that are really immense. And we're such a visual society right now. We're such a society that kind of like, you know, if, if you don't Instagram it, it didn't happen. Right. And so um, I think we have lost our ability to imagine what we're not seeing. And um, that's putting us at risk. Right. And we can't even go to a funeral. So when someone dies, we can't even, that's sort of a way that we see it with our eyes and we can't even go to a funeral exactly. now. So I'm curious going forward, you know, what, what's the, the near term future going to look like in terms of communicating about the pandemic? Well, I think that in the really, really near term for the winter, it's going to be um, it's going to be a tough winter. And I was saying this in July, actually. I was like, everyone is hoping this would be a seasonal uh, thing, but they didn't understand the downside of that, which is, you know, if it's seasonal in the winter, it's going to be really tough. So I think that the communication has to be strong in terms of um, explaining to people why we need to take care not to gather too much inside with folks or, or avoid it at all if possible. Um, and, and then what happens is, you know, hopefully in the spring we'll get a little relief. People will get to be outdoors again and um, at safely at a distance. Uh, leading in, of course, to the big change that will happen, which is the rollout of the vaccine, uh, which is already kind of starting here or there. I know the UK has something that's um, gotten going and um, what's going to be the main science communication challenge and public health challenges, explaining to people, you know, we're all going to be in different situations with regards to the vaccine. How do we interact and how do we um, give a public message that resonates when people might be getting different versions or different, different vaccine versions? And, um, you know, like it's going to be a lot for public health officials to, uh, to relay all this nuance, all the nuances to people. And I think that that's something they should brace for. Mm -hmm. And what types of nuances do you envision? Well, like if, you know, let's say you get a vaccine, but you didn't get your booster shot yet. Um, should we hang out uh, if I'm immunocompromised? Um, or should you go to the grocery store with a mask or without a mask after your two shots? I think that, you know, how are we going to, we're having a hard enough time policing mask wearing where nobody has a vaccine. What's going to happen when some people have a vaccine and say, look, I got my vaccine. I don't want to wear a mask anymore. How do we verify that? And how do we, um, how do we know it's safe for them? And when exactly, you know, it's, I think it's a lot of questions like that. Mm -hmm. And before then it's going to be a long and hard winter. It's going to be a long and hard winter. I mean, I feel fortunate I'm here where it snows a lot and I cross country ski and I skate and I snowshoe. So like I, my therapy is going outside as much as when I'm not in front of a computer um, thinking about the words COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. I'm definitely um, like, you know, outside in the snow. But that being said, yeah, it's going to suck. <laughs> it's going to suck. Well, and on that upbeat note, uh, Roxanne, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Stephanie. And I do want to say that, like, it's going to make every other holiday for the rest of our lives feel so good. So that's a happy note to think on. Excellent. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outlin. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.